uh, my name is Yoriko Kishimoto. I'm a uh, former mayor of Palo Alto and um, a member of the organizing committee here. And I'd like to um, welcome everyone to the panel on local generation and control. Does it matter and does it work? Um, and um, so this is called the Silicon Valley um, Energy Summit. And one of the, um, I just wanted to start by reminding us that Silicon Valley is famous not just for our, our global leadership in, in technology, but the structure and the culture that, that got us here. Uh, that that uh, we broke the mold of kind of large established companies which had an overwhelming um, advantage in scale, scale and market position because of our entrepreneurship and because of our, our unique uh, culture for innovation. So this panel is in a way a, a panel about a different model for managing and delivering energy. And that is local control and local control, local control and local generation, which are two different but related ideas. And asking if, if as a society we should be pursuing that paradigm shift more energetically. We've heard um, from the lunch speaker that Governor Jerry Brown has been promoting since the 1970s this idea of local and distributed energy and the goal of 12,000 megawatts of renewable power generated within local distribution grids. So, um, so for our panel, we have three distinguished um, speakers from the front lines. And so I'm gonna introduce them briefly um, and, and to give you an idea of the flow. And um, so I'm gonna be first introducing uh, Sean, Sean Marshall to speak. Sean is the founder and executive director of Lean USA, and that stands for Local Energy Aggregation Network uh, US, which has a mission to expand and, and support <coughs> clean energy CCAs, and CCA stands for uh, Community Choice Aggregation Programs. Sean was the mayor of uh, uh, Mill Valley in 2008, and she was one of the co-founders of the Marin Energy uh, Authority, the first CCA in California. Um, and after her will be um, uh, Mayor Yahweh Ye, who is um, the, the current ma uh, mayor of Palo Alto, and he has been um, our representative to NCPA, Northern California um, Power Agency. And I know in his, in his day job, he has had the job of uh, many years of experience as assistant um, controller for, uh, I'm sorry, city auditor for uh, Oakland and before then San Francisco. And, and um, he's going to be speaking to us um, as, as, um, as a publicly owned utility. And I know there's a number of publicly owned utilities here in, in the audience as well. So I hope, hope you guys speak up. And then to balance these um, views from publicly owned and, and the community choice aggregation, Deborah Wang is um, uh, going to be sharing her perspective as NRDC's California Energy um, Program Director, and she is an expert on statewide policy and policy results, right? And so before, and she told me that before joining NRDC in 2002, she was uh, worked briefly at the California Energy Commission um, during that famous crisis. So that should take us to um, about halfway through. So especially since we're kind of getting towards the end of the afternoon, I'm trying to leave plenty of room for um, questions from, from the floor. So uh, please be going ahead and um, thinking about questions. So let me start by inviting up and uh, please help me welcome Sean. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you guys are having a good day. Um, I, I first want to answer the questions posed, which is, does local control and local generation matter? And you will not be surprised that I say with a resounding uh, enthusiasm, yes, 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 both matter. I think we're going to see that they matter more and more as time goes on. So what I'm going to talk to you today about, if I can see this lovely screen, is um, one of the newer methods in the state of California, at least, not new across the country. Um, to aggregating local energy um, at the, the county and or regional level through which then to take over your um, portfolio, your supply portfolio, and have some choice and control over the kind of supply that you're offering up your customers. And that is called community choice aggregation. It is a hideous name, so I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, CCA, think about it as like a big Groupon or... Um, 
living social deal for electricity at the residential and um, small commercial level, because that's what it is. All right. Now, folks, let's see. So what is CCA? I often find that um, this picture works very well for those of you. Who, well, first of all, I should ask, how many of you are familiar with the CCA model? Okay, all kinds of you, okay. How many of you here are representative of um, public utilities? Okay, great, all right, good. So I'll just run through this quickly. So what we talk about up in Marin County is that CCA is the biggest change you'll never notice because what's happening here is that the local governments, in our case, the, the cities and towns of Marin, got together and decided to form a joint powers agency or through which to run the CCA to take over the energy supply. We partner with the incumbent utility. In our case, it's PG&E. In Southern California, it's SDG&E, SoCal Edison. The utility is our partner. It was a shotgun marriage. It's getting better. Um, and they continue to, to provide customer billing, customer support, pole and wire maintenance. And so the end use customer, you, doesn't actually experience anything different about your you know, receipt, receipt of energy or your billing. But what you are getting in the case of Marin County is a default product that is a 50% green and then up to 100% opt up. So it's a voluntary opt up to 100% green product at rates that are comparable to PG&E's, but that green um, underlying renewable portfolio that we've got is twice and now pushing into three times as much as what um, PG&E is currently offering its customers. We also explain CCA as a hybrid approach, kind of a third option that lives between two vertically integrated approaches, one of which is the uh, shareholder investor-owned utility, PG&E's of the world, and the other is a full municipal utility, Palo Alto, for example, uh, City of Reading. There are a number of them around the state. Um, in the end, Personally, I think that the home run is having a, a full municipal utility and the ability to control not only your supply side, but your distribution, okay? What is the reality of that, though, in the current condition in this state? And frankly, why would a local government or group of governments want to bond for multiple millions, if not billions of dollars to take over a system that is antiquated? So um, what CCA offers is a way to um, control the front end of the destiny, if you will. And what we're hoping for over time is functional separation so that, as we see in other states, the utility then really focuses on its core bread and butter and what is painfully needed, which is the T&D system, smart grid, really bringing our grid up to speed. Let communities have some control and some choice around how they source and um, and procure their power, and that's what CCA offers. This is the quick policy framework. Um, CCA in California was enacted back in 2002. There was a, another piece of legislation last year which strengthens uh, the law in this state. Um, CCA, especially if you're focused on the clean energy aspect, absolutely uh, feeds right into AB 32 requirements. When I'm out talking with local governments, that really matters to them because ultimately it saves money over time in terms of AB 32 compliance. By participating in a CCA, my town, which is small, up in just north of San Francisco, we're able to meet our compliance within about four years with nothing more than having joined the Marin Energy Authority, which is buying greater and greater percentage of renewables. Um, Yoriko mentioned the governor's renewable energy mandate of 12,000 megawatts by 2020. What's interesting about this, and perhaps Nancy touched on this, it's 12,000 megawatts of local distributed generation, 8,000 megawatts of utility scale. So I find that interesting from a policy perspective in terms of what the governor is saying um, his priority is. And I'm very pleased to say that within that report, and I've given you the link here, you can go on, online and find it. Um, CCA is mentioned several times as one of the key uh, methodologies of incentivizing and facilitating new renewable energy development throughout the state. I think I told you the customer experience really isn't that different because um, what essentially happens is by legislation around the country, CCA is an opt-out program. Uh, and the reason for that is that for those of you who remember Green Mountain Energy and some of those others, those were opt-in programs 
they were never able to achieve scale. And it's not because they weren't well-run companies or offering a good product. It's because the average American doesn't really think about their energy. They just want to make sure that the lights go on and they're getting to work and feeding their kids. So in order to create a level market, an open market, and create a level playing field, CCA has been legislated as opt out. A customer can opt out any time uh, without charge, and then after a certain period, it's for a small charge. In our case, it's $5. If, if a customer wants to leave and go back to pg e at any time, they can do that. And then as I said, the utility continues to provide all the T&D and billing services. CCA, um, and it's called municipal energy aggregation, government energy aggregation, all kinds of different names, but aggregation is the primary term. Um, currently exists in six states. I'm happy to report that that orange state is New Jersey. Uh, this slide is only a few months old, but they are now getting ready to launch their first two CCAs. We see a huge surge in growth in the Midwest. 243 communities went to ballot to approve municipal aggregation. Their primary reason is that they're saving 25% on average, upwards of 30% on their electricity bill over the default Commonwealth Edison and, um, and Ameren. So, um, and there's tremendous growth in Ohio as well. And we're seeing some growth in California. I'm not gonna go through these here, but if you wanna take a look at these stats, this is how CCA is playing out around the country. Um, we think that in California, we have an opportunity to create kind of the most mature model, because what happens here is that the communities actually own their aggregation. You form a joint powers agency, which means that you are able to capture the existing revenue that was previously, in our case, going to pg e You're taking that percentage of revenue, redirecting it into a local agency to pay for your cost of power to run your agency, but then there's also an operating margin. And what we're seeing in Marin is even within two years, uh, we've got an operating margin through which to do electric vehicle charging stations, where we run an energy efficiency training program with, in one of our low-income neighborhoods. We run a green business program. So there are a lot of local um, goals that can be met through the residual that comes through the ratepayer income. So this is not a taxpayer-funded initiative. There's no federal subsidies, none of that. It is a market-based solution that is enabled at the local level. Here's how it's growing um, across California. Two minutes, okay. Many cities. <laughs> Why do you do it? Three reasons, local economic impact. Don't underestimate the value of that redirected ratepayer revenue. On the previous slide, um, we're looking at anywhere from, in, in Marin, it's gonna be $100 million annually if San Diego should decide to go for it, it's gonna be 1.3 billion annually in redirected revenue. So um, it's, it's not chump change in terms of what's happening at the local level. The environment, if you take over um, your supply portfolio and you have control over what you're buying and the, the programs, feed-in tariff, net energy metering, um, all of that, think about what you can really do for the environment in terms of pushing ahead with more nimbleness than the utilities on what's happening in terms of renewable supply. Um, in this state, consumer choice matters. We don't have it right now. So CCA in those areas that, um, where it's being offered are offering choice, and that's true even in restructured states. This is an example of uh, the town of San Anselmo's participation in the Marin Energy Authority, that long orange line. That's a third party analysis of the number of metric tons of carbon reduction that they're getting from just their membership in MEA. And by the way, they didn't pay to become a member. So it's, um, it's been a, a big win-win for the town. This slide shows job creation. How can CCAs be competitive? We'll skip through this because you can take a look at this and feel free to call me about it. There are risks. The biggest risk right now in the state of California is price competition. It's hard here to you know, overpromise and say we're going to beat the incumbent utilities uh, rates. We're at natural, uh, historic lows for natural gas, which many of you heard about in the previous session. Um, and so it's tough to be competitive. But what we can do is remain competitive and really, uh, as I said, push the envelope in terms of renewable supply. There's political risk just because it comes through a local government. Your city council and board of supervisors has to board. Uh, 
vote to enact it. That can be hard because we're not typically energy experts. This is Marin's program. I'll let you take a look at these slides later. I think the three things I want to leave with you about Marin's program is that um, we came through years of fierce utility opposition and tons of money thrown at the opposition to make it to the launch point. Nobody's lights went out. Everything is working. The organization is, uh, is meeting its bottom line and making money. There is, you know, 5% margin or so. Uh, we've just expanded to the city of Richmond, just joined the MEA, thereby offering choice to those uh, residents and, and businesses there. We have just signed our first feed-in tariff project, which is a solar installation at a, um, a regional airport. We have net energy metering. We have 400 customers with solar on their rooftop feeding back into the CCA. So these are examples of what can happen. If, um, if you would like to know more about CCA or what we're doing, feel free to give me a call. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thanks, Sean, and, and thanks for your work in, in putting, bring, bring, bringing us to market. It's, it's, a, it's a tremendous ac um, accomplishment. Um, Mayor Yang. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Stanford and Palo Alto. Uh, it's just great that we actually have a chance to uh, get together, uh, convene, and have a discussion around all these different topics today. Um, let me take a quick moment as I bring up my presentation, and I will be quick. So it's interesting, uh, actually, with Marin, because uh, we, we hear a lot of the, the same values um, within CCAs as we do within municipal utilities. So today, um, I really want to just, after seeing the, the number of hands that were raised around CCAs, I'll keep my uh, early slides, which just provide some broad context about publicly owned utilities um, and comparing them to investor-owned utilities uh, to uh, as brief as possible. Um, just to give an overall sense, though, in the U.S., there are about 46 million people um, that receive their uh, electricity from publicly-owned utilities. Um, there are about 2,000 public power entities uh, throughout the, the country, and uh, it, it's uh, something that we are proud to be a part of that tradition. Uh, in Palo Alto, we have had our own electric utility for about 100 years, a little over 100 years, actually, I think since 1900, um, which is a lot older than me. Um, <laughs> so what we wanted to, to focus on today was what has that meant uh, for a community like Palo Alto? Uh, but first, I wanted to start off uh, where there is similarity between publicly owned utilities and investor owned utilities. There are state laws that imp impact both sets of utilities and both models. Um, the example that we have uh, here is uh, public benefits programs. Uh, there will always be a need within whatever model you have for uh, an electric utility uh, to have cost-effective energy uh, efficiency and conservation, new investment in technology, um, specifically around renewable resources, uh, R&D uh, and demonstration projects, and then finally, uh, within whatever utility structure or model you have, there will always be low-income ratepayers within uh, those service areas. So it's important for this kind of legislation to be put in place so that you have this flexibility and acknowledgement of ability to pay within the different structures. Uh, a comparison, though, uh, really highlights where there's a lot of value for the rate payer uh, within a publicly owned utility. Uh, there's a lot of transparency. Two weeks ago, uh, the city of Palo Alto just passed its uh, budget. As part of that budget process, any member of the community that's a rate payer for our electric utility can submit, basically, uh, their uh, I'll call it in very diplomatic terms, concerns about any rate changes. <laughs> and they are given the time of day during uh, a city council meeting to come and speak to their concerns, uh, basically to, to uh, express that they object to any kind of uh, potential increase. Uh, ultimately, if there is a certain percent, if there's a majority of rate payers that express objection to a rate increase, uh, that rate increase won't move forward. And you, you don't get that same uh, model or structure within an investor-owned utility. So there, there's one uh, benefit in itself. Um, for the return on investment, for a lot of the investor-owned utilities, uh, sometimes it's not clear uh, exactly where uh, some of the profit uh, is going to, but you do know that it's going toward shareholders. For publicly-owned utilities, uh, any kind of equity transfer from a publicly-owned utility 
uh, will benefit the general fund. So the, the electric fund within Palo Alto, uh, where wherever we have a return on an investment, that flows directly into our general fund, which then is reinvested directly into public services. Uh, and that's broadly defined. Our general fund funds public safety, to our parks, to our streets and sidewalks. So there's a lot of, uh, I'll call it a virtuous cycle, of how we can use our uh, funds from uh, basically what we're, we're receiving in terms of return on investment from ratepayers. And the last area is, uh, uh, Sean did allude to it, uh, the city council functions as the governing board for the electric utility. Um, this is my fifth year on city council, and I feel that uh, quite a large proportion of my brain cells are now con dedicated to thinking about our utilities within Palo Alto. Um, and just, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, very interesting policy areas that you can uh, wrestle with. Um, programs, services that our utilities, uh, local utilities excel at that ultimately the city council has to be um, savvy about. Uh, in Palo Alto, we've created something called the Utilities Advisory Commission. Uh, we're fortunate to have a community where if you think you know it, someone from the community is going to step up and say, I actually have three PhDs in it. And we're going to be a part of this dis discussion and we want to be, uh, uh, we want to contribute basically to the, to the good thinking that the utility is doing. Uh, so to move on and to just be quick, uh, but a very important aspect also of what Sean highlighted was the joint action. So uh, again, because Palo Alto is an, uh, an older established public electric utility, what we've been able to do uh, through, and I know Jim Pope, our general manager of the Northern California Power Agency is in the audience, through joint action we've been able to partner with other uh, municipal utilities. And uh, through a whole variety of areas, uh, the power of joint action can have a lot of economies of scale through procurement. It can have a lot of economies of scale through uh, actual uh, construction of generation projects. Uh, there's an incredible value through joint action as it relates to legislative uh, and ad legislation and advocacy. Uh, when you have joint voices that represent a breadth of uh, basically different types of customer bases in the different public utilities, uh, it's an essential addition to uh, what's going on in Sacramento or in Washington, D.C. Um, so NCPA uh, really has been a, a key uh, uh, convener uh, and action driver for a lot of us within this public space in Northern California. Uh, one particular value is that we can, as a public utility, control our own supply. Uh, the community uh, has very clear objectives. Uh, when you as a council member are voted in or out, uh, part of that discussion also necessarily involves well, what's your perspective on what you want our electric portfolio, uh, our resources um, to be? And in Palo Alto, uh, there's uh, this, this set of uh, discussion areas that have just been very much uh, part of our utility commission's annual review of rates and programs <coughs> and services, and then ultimately the city council's vote on uh, our annual budget. Um, so in general, some high-level points from the American Public Power Association, 14% uh, uh, is the differential between investor-owned utility uh, rates versus uh, publicly-owned rates, with the publicly-owned utilities being 14% lower. And uh, the equity transfer uh, that I just had talked about earlier, um, that's quantified at 15%. Uh, in Palo Alto in particular, uh, there's a, a huge commitment to sustainability and what we can do through our electric utility. This is true through all of our sister agencies in NCPA. And as a result of the ability for local communities to define this, uh, their own policy objectives, uh, we, we all have and are aware of the 33% RPS goal uh, that ultimately will impact IOUs uh, by 2020. Uh, in, uh, so in Palo Alto, we have a 33% by 2015, and that's uh, because of our ability to have that, that local uh, um, plan. One, one highlight from this year that I, I really wanted to point out, uh, we, in a typical hydro year, have about uh, 70 to 80% uh, carbon-free or uh, no emission um, resources. As a result, we set a goal that by January 1st, 2015, we wanted to have 100% clean portfolio. Uh, will be one of the first utilities, uh, you know, whatever the structure, uh, to achieve that. And it's led to a lot of uh, late night discussions and sessions and, I mean, affectionately nerding out uh, with staff 
and um, utility commissioners and city council members. Um, let me skip over uh, then to uh, really the last area, which is about local generation. Um, this, this particular opportunity uh, really is, it's still in development uh, within Palo Alto. We've recently put in a feed-in tariff. We price it at 14 cents per kilowatt hour. It was focused on solar rooftop. Uh, we found that that has not quite penciled out for uh, some of the solar developers. Uh, for us, when we saw that uh, there was this opportunity to move forward with it, we wanted to be able to partner with our business community in, in particular. Um, it's iterative. Uh, the advantage of being and having local control is that at the city council level and in coordination with utility staff, we can revisit what we've done in terms of pegging our feed-in tariff um, rate. Uh, and the, the last area that I'll, I'll focus on, I, I feel a hook. Uh, <laughs> the, the last area I'll, I'll focus on, though, is that um, this is just one of uh, a menu of options that we're trying to provide to our rate payers. Um, we've had a PV Partners, which is a rebate program to install uh, solar panels uh, available to our uh, commercial customers since uh, late the, the late 90s. So it's really about how you provide a menu of options um, around local generation uh, that I think en truly enables the publicly owned utility to have a lot of value. Thank you. Uh, great, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Ye. And actually, could I ask Jim Pope to stand up so we can acknowledge him as well? Great. Yeah, so, I, so especially as we're, since we're nearing the end of the day, I'm just trying to leave enough time for questions. And, and so let's welcome up uh, Deborah Wang. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I uh, am with the Natural Resources Defense Council. We're a national nonprofit environmental organization, and we advocate for strategies to cut pollution and build a, a clean energy economy. And so we're often asked to weigh in on this question of, of one type of utility structure or another, and people are often surprised to learn that we're actually agnostic when it comes to um, the, the basic structure of the utility. And that's because we really focus on environmental outcomes and um, what's going to get us there, and that's environmental policies. And um, we've really seen both um, the best performers and the worst performers at both investor-owned utilities and publicly-owned utilities. So when we think about the different types of uh, utility structures, we really look at who is the policymaker or the regulator that's going to set these uh, key environmental policies. And, uh, Mary Ye touched on this a bit. For the investor and utilities, the policymaker is the California Public Utilities Commission. It's a five member commission. Uh, the commissioners are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the California Senate. Uh, for the publicly owned utilities, it's either the city council or a local board of directors. And for community choice aggregators, usually uh, a local board of directors. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people uh, have raised Marin as, as a great example, leading the way on, on CCAs. In that case, in my mind, the question isn't so much the energy provider. In that case, uh, Marin switched from PG&E to Shell, and I think most people would question that direction. And, but the, the real question, I think, is who's going to make better policies? Is it the Marin Board of Directors or the California Public Utilities Commission? And who do you want setting these policies about environmental issues, rate issues, and the many other issues that have been raised? Um, so what I'm going to um, talk a little bit about is the track record of the investor-owned utilities and the publicly-owned utilities in California on uh, environmental uh, performance and our top priority energy resources. So you've heard earlier today our, our top three priorities uh, in the state are energy efficiency, renewable energy and distributed generation, and then getting off dirty power. So I'll, I'll touch briefly on, on the performance that we've seen in each of those areas. Um, so starting with energy efficiency, uh, this is the state's top priority because it's both the, the cleanest and the cheapest resource. What this graph shows is in red is the investor-owned utilities, in blue the publicly-owned utilities, um, and this shows their annual energy savings as a percent of retail sales. So it's aggregating for both class of utilities their energy savings and then normalizing it to make it apples to apples comparison across the different size utilities. 
And what you can see, uh, I'm sure many of you know that the investor-owned utilities in California have been leaders for decades on energy efficiency. A few new laws were passed uh, in the mid-2000s, and the publicly-owned utilities have really been um, increasing their energy savings dramatically, uh, thanks in large part to NCPA's leadership, and you just recognize Jim and, and Mary A, uh, who work with them, and, and we hope that leadership will continue. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of, of dramatic improvement there and that gap closing. With renewable energy, it's been a similar story. Um, the, the publicly owned utilities have started to catch up across the board, um, and everyone needs to now reach for 33% by 2020. Of course, there's variations among the different investor-owned utilities and publicly owned utilities. As Mary Ye noted, some of the publicly owned utilities have done far better than uh, some of the investor-owned utilities, and vice versa. So when it comes to distributed generation, the state has numerous policies to uh, promote DG. This slide just gives an overview of the investor-owned utilities policies. The publicly-owned utilities have many of the same or similar policies, but there's somewhat less consistency across uh, the POUs as a whole. So there's two main categories of distributed generation. There's uh, what's often considered wholesale, distributed generation, which is projects that are on the utility side of the meter, and then there's projects on the customer side of the meter. So the reason that there's so many different uh, types of policies to get at it is that the policies are really aimed at overcoming the obstacles that each type of project faces and uh, the developer and the level of resources or sophistication that the developer has. So starting at the large end, uh, the Public Utilities Commission adopted a renewable auction mechanism for any project up to 20 megawatts. So these are pretty big sized uh, renewable DG projects. It offers a standardized contract, but these projects are expected to compete based on price. So it's uh, intended to get the best price for customers. They have a feed-in tariff uh, for projects up to one and a half megawatts. And there it's for smaller projects, so there's both a standardized contract and a standard fixed price. And then on the customer side of the meter, you're probably much more familiar with these. Uh, net metering, which allows customers to get full credit for the retail value of the electricity that they're generating. The, the solar uh, programs that provide rebates for both new and existing homes. And then there's also this self-generation incentive program, which is really designed to advance some of the newer or more emerging technologies like fuel cells or, or distributed wind generation. This graph, I just wanted to give a sense of the size and scale of each of these types of policies, what they're trying to get at. Uh, so starting uh, with the smallest projects, customer side uh, programs, those are the smaller distributed generation projects, but we're expecting to get a fair amount of capacity uh, from those policies. The feed-in tariff is, is more of a niche, uh, but an, a very important one, and uh, there's been a lot of projects thanks to the development of these. Uh, that's anything up to one and a half megawatts. You can see the renewable auction mechanism, bigger projects, somewhat more capacity, and then of course the renewable portfolio standard is expected to get uh, significantly more capacity and that goes up to much, much larger size projects. So the next category is uh, getting ourselves off of dirty power. And in 2006, the state passed the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Performance Standard, which essentially requires that all utilities um, ensure that any new long-term financial commitments that they make to power plants be with plants that are um, low emission, basically. Um, the Public Utilities Commission has been implementing that uh, aggressively. By next year, the investor-owned utilities will no longer have any ownership stake or long-term contracts with power plants that do not meet the standard. Um, the publicly owned utilities, mostly in Southern California, still get about 2,500 megawatts of power from plants that do not meet the standard. These are mostly the big coal-fired power plants that are out of the state importing power here. Um, and that's a big problem. We're polluting our neighbors and, and trying to take advantage of that low-cost power. And the CEC is in the process of a rulemaking to try to uh, help the publicly owned utilities uh, get off that dirty power. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Jim. Only 
so I wanted to, to leave you with just two of the current issues um, that have been live, and, and you heard various folks uh, earlier in the day talk about these. The first is research and development. Um, this is, of course, of, of great interest to folks here in Silicon Valley um, and all of the clean tech entrepreneurs. The Public Utilities Commission recently approved $162 million a year to go to the Energy Commission's Public Interest Energy Research Program. Um, and it remains an open question whether the, the publicly owned utilities will contribute to this statewide research and development effort. Um, proportionally, they should be contributing roughly on the order of $50 million a year in research and development uh, if they were going to be proportional to the IOUs. And then, of course, the, the AB32 cap and trade program is uh, beginning this year. And um, every utility in the state is being given allowances, which are basically permits to pollute. Uh, on behalf of their customers, and those are very valuable. And so the Public Utilities Commission has an ongoing proceeding right now to look at um, what to do with the value of those allowances. And uh, the publicly owned utilities are going to be getting allowances worth somewhere in the range of $300 million to $500 million a year. Uh, and so are we going to use that to cut emissions? We should start having, having that discussion. So this very brief overview, I wanted to just show that uh, the spread in terms of environmental performance has been narrowing. That's the good news. Um, six years ago, I think it was, I challenged uh, my friends in the public power community to, to take uh, the leadership role and, and do better than the investor in utilities. As you can see, they've uh, begun to close that gap, and I renew that challenge to you today. And I look forward, as a customer of Immuni, I would love to be able to get up here and say, you've, you've taken the lead. So next time, I hope to do that. Thank you. Yes. Can um, I make one clarifying comment? Yes, please. That'd be great. Um, just, just on behalf of, of MEA, just so you know, I think it's important for people to understand that MEA does have Shell Energy North America as its, as its supply customer energy service provider. But um, what's critical and what we're teaching other communities is that it, it's fine to have the, the third party supplier as your partner, but we also have uh, four direct to market power purchase agreements for both solar and biogas. And coming up on Thursday, we have two more long-term PPAs that have nothing to do with Shell. They're going direct to the market for new renewable um, infrastructure. So it's a, a diversified portfolio, and, and you know, just wanted to be clear about that. The second thing is that in its first um, reporting cycle, Marin Energy Authority beat the California RPS by about 40 percent. So it just shows you that with that nimbleness, and you know. It's expensive to do it, so you know it's we got to build some market scale. But you've got the nimbleness to to meet and beat that RPS in pretty short order. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, so that's good because actually I was going to just ask if there was any quick responses to each other because I I, I do want this to be a discussion. But um, and I also have some questions, but I, I'm going to give priority to the audience who has been wait, you know that. So if we if you're interested in asking question, please please. Coming up, but as you're coming up, um, were there any other quick other responses from either Mayor Ye or, or Deborah to each other's? Happy, okay. Happy to defer. Oh, okay, That's great. Right. All right. So um, yes, please introduce yourself, and um, we'll try to res try to limit each kind of question and answer to say two or three minutes, just so we can hear as m from as many people as possible. Right, Greg Ham, Stratalytics Consulting. Uh, to the, the most probably the most prominent. A local generation option right now, uh, prominent in terms of people being aware of it, is residential solar. This seems to have two significant problems as it's being implemented so far. One is that it uh, tends to have a subsidy from lower income uh, electric users to higher income electric users. Second, in California, much of that is concentrated in coastal areas that have uh, economics that are not quite as good as inland areas in California. Um, are you concerned about those uh, worries? And if you are, what are you doing to address them? Um, I will just say that I expect that our procurement manager in Marin is thinking about those things. But for right now, that's not something that uh, comes up necessarily from a policy perspective with CCA. I, within Palo Alto, I'll, I'll, I'll actually add another issue, <laughs> another potential barrier, which is permitting, um, which is the process actually to, to go through local, uh, and that's something that we also are working through to enable residential 
customers uh, to, you know, there's a differentiation between new construction and whether or not that can be built in and integrated through uh, a, a new permit uh, versus existing structures. Um, we have some uh, rebates, for example, uh, for solar water heaters that we found uh, some uh, challenges from a residential perspective. Uh, we don't have the uptake, actually, that we had hoped for around solar water heaters. Um, and this is anecdotal. I'm also going to acknowledge that our utilities director from Palo Alto, Val Fong, oh, yes, uh, is here. Um, so if I misspeak, I, I, she'll, she'll jump all over me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but uh, just that there are structural issues that sometimes come up from residential perspectives that say, well, if we have you know, older rooftops, we clearly have a desire to move forward on this, but the permitting won't allow us to do this because of your concerns around structural integrity. Um, and that's something, too, where we're, we are addressing it, and uh, we don't have an answer just yet. So it's, it's on the radar. And I would just add, I think uh, you raised one of the key issues that is really starting to be debated across the state when it comes to the net metering policies, because it really is a subsidy or an incentive program. When you are getting credit for the full retail price of the power, that means that you're not paying for all of the transmission and distribution and other fixed costs of the system that you're still taking advantage of. Um, so clearly, Solar technology deserves to have uh, incentives from the state. The question is how much and what forms, and I think that um, we need to have a fuller discussion across the state about this issue, recognizing um, all of the different policies that are in place and making sure that we're uh, taking the best advantage that we can of all of them. Well, and, and I'll recant and say CCA does have an interest in this um, right now, mainly from the perspective of cost shifting that's going on. So um, because net energy metering is definitely an integrated program into CCA, we, we encourage folks to actually supersize their, um, their projects in order to sell the power back into the local CCA. That way you're not getting out to the, the, the large transmission at all. But if you've got cost shifting going on over to T&D, that's creating some competitive problems. Okay, thank you. Next. Hi, I'm Jerry Glazer from Sunnyvale. I play two roles there right now. Thank you for answering the third of the questions that I had here about uh, CCA on net metering. Um, one of my roles is uh, chairman of a committee called Horizon 2035, which was taxed with coming up with a climate action plan. The general plan changes for land use and transportation. And after 18 months of working and studying and rewriting all of that, that the consultants come back in and say, you can only achieve your climate action plan goals if you have a CCA. Um, it turns out if you make all the changes in the city, you couldn't actually achieve the reductions that you want to re achieve. It's like that slide I showed. Um, in Palo Alto, thank you for the RFP. Uh, one of the things we had as a committee was we said, oh, we want to have 50% of the power from our city uh, be generated from within the borders of our city. I saw your RFP recently where you're trying to pick up uh, 100 kilowatts a, a clip uh, from inside the city. Um, and Sean, I've gone to your sites and I've gone to your seminars. So the second job I have is Sunnyvale, neither what, of which I get paid for. I'm a sustainability commissioner. And the reason that I got reappointed uh, for a second term was I pointed out that what we needed was a CCA. And I'm now on a subcommittee which is uh, investigating CCAs. Mm. So okay. a lot of your material has been very, very useful. Give us a call. Um, oh, yeah, I'd like, like to talk help. to you quite a bit about it. Um, the, the main thing that is a concern, uh, by the way, we'd have more accounts than you plan on having ultimately, because we're the second largest city in uh, Santa mm -hmm. Clara and the fifth in the Bay Area, um, is the resistance that people will have for having a CCA. And, and yet I can't see the facts that would stop somebody from wanting to have a CCA but yet I can already tell that most of the discussion is, well, why are you going to force this on us? And I, I know you've been wrestling with that. Do, do you have any particular uh, hints and ways of twisting this? Even the press you mm -hmm. got recently wasn't all that great um, uh, of nipping that in the bud. Oh. Well, I, mean, I think you have to start with just an acknowledgement that if, if people think something ain't broke, then why, why do they want to fix it, uh, right? And as I said earlier, in my experience as an elected official, our constituents aren't thinking about this stuff, really. I mean, it's, it's a big nerd party. And so, so I, think, I think what you have to really explain to them is that it, it really is about 
making the shift to a clean power, cleaner air, you got to bring it back to what matters to them because it's not about the model at all. And I think the other thing that really is going to resonate with them is the value of that redirected revenue. It's not going back. In CCA's case, it doesn't go back into the general fund. So you can avoid any, you know, sort of perception of that. But what it is doing is that it's stimulating um, local, develop local uh, renewables. It enables uh, solar rooftop. There's, there are many integrative factors of CCA, which I'm happy to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. um, the third item is, um, oh gosh, you just asked me. I'll, I'll think of it and get back okay. to it. But okay. yes, we do have some strategies to deal with that. Hello, I'm Richard Topping with Green Data Centers Worldwide, and I have a quick question. Um, with a brand new technology that can literally take um, and feed into the power grid that has zero emission, how would I get something like that approved to, to go into the feed-in tariff? Is there, a, I mean, is it an extended process, or how quickly can that be accomplished? Uh, for our, our particular program in Palo Alto, we actually have a monthly um, process, a cycle to actually invite people to submit applications <laughs> if they're interested. So uh, the good thing is our utilities director is two rows behind you. <laughs> 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 but it's, it's something where, uh, it, it, you know, like I said, we're, we're learning lessons through the, it started in April uh, 2012, so we've just had a couple months to learn from it. And uh, in all, from my perspective, uh, we're continuing to, to tweak it uh, just based on the lessons that we've learned through. Is there currently a limit on how much power we can produce? We've put a cap of four megawatts on the entire program. This is seen as a pilot, um, okay. but I think a minimum of one megawatt. Uh, so there's, it's a tight band, um, and it's really something that it, it's, I, I think, you know, as we get more basically data points and intelligence from the people who are even considering and interested in this program within Palo Alto, then we can start tweaking it as necessary. Well, I definitely am. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Val. <laughs> I know you're busy. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So we have three more qu questioners, and um, I, I think we'll just run two or three minutes into the break. If you, if it's okay, we, we have. I know there's a coffee break until four. So, okay, welcome. All right, my name is Robert Ferber from San Jose State University in Sustainable Silicon Valley. Today we heard about a lot about local control, but I don't feel we heard enough about local generation. From both the point of view of the CCA and the uh, the PUC, how do you rank the following in terms of importance for generation? The cost per uh, gigawatt hour, the uh, proximity of the generation, or environmental sustainability. And when you say environmental sustainability, you mean the type of generation? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, yeah. you know, for uh, one of the projects that we're considering actually is the anaerobic digest, uh, digestion project. Um, we had a ballot measure, measure E, that was really related to waste to energy facility. Um, we have a regional um, wastewater treatment plant um, that also is immediately adjacent to landfill. Uh, the vote, the ballot measure was to undedicate 10 acres of parkland to consider a long term, you know, to create basically for 10 years to give us a time frame to look at some local generation um, options as it related to, uh, you know, regional wastewater treatment plants um, have sewage sludge at the back end of the entire process and whether or not we could uh, consider um, some waste energy options for that in addition to our, uh, our landfill. Um, and it's, it just, this passed just recently, um, actually Monday night, if you are looking for a good time, you can come to the city council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be talking about it until the wee hours of the morning, and it's all about local generation. Um, it's, uh, you know, for prioritization of cost, proximity, and environmental sustainability. It, it all depends. I mean, all of those are important. It's hard to say that one's going to trump the other. Um, if something ultimately is, you know, going to be this pristine um, project in terms of envi environmental sustainability, but break the bank, uh, as a local utility, you have to be very cognizant that you have, uh, you basically have a, a captive audience, a captive uh, population that are ratepayers. Um, so you can't deprioritize cost in any way. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time. You know, for proximity, we, we want to consider uh, all things that are just within local, so you, you don't have to think through transmission issues. You can just really uh, identify it. That was the basis for our feed-in tariff, ultimately where we can uh, have distributed generation um, rather than, you know, really have to tackle through, uh, I mean, 
interconnected. Even if you're a nerd, transmission issues can really <laughs> <laughs> just challenge you with the level of detail um, that, that you have to wade through and the bureaucracy that exists around transmission mm -hmm. um, and the dynamics with um, your relationship with your investor-owned utility. And for us, it's PG&E. So um, that's a, 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 a current example of a project that we're looking at that we're excited by, but it's really going to come down to the details. I would just add, I think that environmental performance is really a threshold issue when it comes to distributed generation um, and the policies that I talked about. There are both very clean technologies and extremely dirty technologies. In fact, some of the dirtiest technologies out there are fossil fuel fired distributed generation like backup diesel generators. Um, and from a public health perspective, it's much, much worse to have the pollution in the place where everyone's breathing it as opposed to somewhere further away from where people are living. Um, so I think that uh, environmental factors are a threshold for these policies. Proximity is also to some extent a threshold because it's really not distributed generation if it's far away from population centers. Um, and then I think a lot of it really does come down to cost. We have these policies to try to help these technologies uh, gain acceptance in the market and bring down their costs. Um, but today the costs are still higher than um, the large central station plants that have economies of scale. So. Um, hopefully with a lot of these policies, we'll start bringing those costs down. Uh, so Deborah, I just have a quick follow-up question there. Remember, I, I was going to ask you about the, um, the avoided cost in, in distribution. Um, do you, do you if, if we are able to produce locally and avoid the, um, the long-distance uh, distribution, how much do we save in general? I mean, it's, what's, what's a good way to look at that? So it's a great question. Of course, the answer varies wildly depending on where you are. I would say very roughly speaking, um, the transmission component is 10 to 20 percent of the retail price. Mm -hmm. um, distribution is a significant chunk as well, but with distributed generation, you're not avoiding distribution costs usually. Right. Um, so the transmission costs are significant. In some cases, they can be very significant, especially if you're uh, avoiding or deferring the need for a whole new transmission line. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not as big as uh, the entire, you know, avoided cost of the TND and the generation. So it's okay. a small but meaningful component. Thank you, thank you. And just to quickly answer your question, I would say that um, for CCAs that are focused on a long-term goal of asset formation and, and ownership within the portfolio, mm -hmm. it's going to be, um, it's gonna be a, a spectrum of time because I think until we build market scale and we're able to compete against the 10,000 pound gorilla in the room called the IOU, um, cost matters to us. But there's no question that the environmental benefits um, are part of the reason why we came to, to be. We led with a greenhouse gas goal. So that's why Marin CCA came to be. Um, we're really focused on local uh, solar. So we have a solar shares project going in over our ferry building that's a solar structure, but it allows individuals like me who live under trees to invest in a piece of that and credit that toward my bill as, an, as a net energy metering customer. It's a lot like SMUD's program. We've got the program going in at the airport. So we're doing everything we can to push not only local in-county generation, but also we're very interested in a, in a regional picture. Um, so how do we sync up with Sonoma, for example, who's considering a CCA and tap into their um, geothermal? stuff. So there are a couple of different ways to look at it. Um, cost matters, proximity definitely matters, but I would say in order it's cost, environmental proximity. Okay. Right. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Uh, my name is Emily Thomas. I'm a graduate student here at Stanford. And um, I guess you've kind of all touched on my question a little bit. I'm interested in very local generation and net metering. And I'm wondering if you've talked about kind of the implications on the local infrastructure and what improvements might need to be made to the substation to allow electricity to go both ways. And if you're including that in your, your thoughts and about costs and moving towards this 33% renewables, which will probably include a lot of local generation. Um, well, you're absolutely right that in order to sort of get to that vision of a very distributed grid, we do need to make significant improvements in the underlying grid infrastructure. So all of the smart grid issues that were discussed earlier, um, you know, having a, a grid that can communicate with different parts of itself and um, have the grid operator understand what's happening in real time um, at all of the different points. Um, 
we expect to see a shifting peak, and that's going to um, have really big implications for how we do the rest of our, our planning in the in the whole system. Um, so uh, right now, some of the folks talked about earlier, solar tends to peak uh, somewhere in the noon to four time frame. If we get to really high um, penetrations of distributed generation, then we can see the, the local peak shifting. And that influences everything from the big central plants that you build to the size of the distribution transformers that you have um, locally. So. I think that there does need to be a lot of changes. I'm not sure that the state has really developed a vision yet, though, for exactly what the grid would look like if we got to really high penetration um, rates with DG. But it's something that the CEC is exploring um, very actively. Yeah, I think I'm thinking even more mechanical, just how you can change what's already in the substation to allow for electricity to go backwards. Um, I see that as I don't know. something that isn't talked about very much. If you're saying, for instance, you encourage your customers to oversize, then you're going to need to go through and reevaluate your substations. So I just I haven't heard very much discussion about you. that. Yeah. It would be great if there was an engineer in the room to <laughs> talk about that. I was going to say, I'm, that's point. my field. Yeah. Well, there you go. I, I was going to touch on that probably. Okay. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but it's kind of interesting to hear how we're um, we're we're demonizing net metering. Uh, like we have demonized uh, electric car chargers versus air conditioners and how we've demonized electricity as a fuel source for electric vehicles versus gasoline. And in full disclosure, I've had a solar array in my roof for since 1999. Drove an EV1, RAV4, EV, now I got the LEAF. So the thing is that wind is an intermittent resource and wind is a real problem because it is kind of the anti-load follower. It blows at nights and not every night. It does not blow at 3 p.m. when we have the supercritical peak in California. Solar energy in the distribution grid is a huge win for us. And it may be arguable that net metering is, in fact, the right model for solar generation because it's taking high-cost power, peaker power plants offline during the day. It's reducing the need for those. It's also lessening the load on the distribution grid because what drives the actual peaks? It's air conditioning plus a lot of other things going on. But it's air conditioning that puts us over the top okay. and kills us, right? So and I know I've, surf I've suffered through two five-day blackouts from local right. distribution grid. That was air conditioning, you know not EVs and stuff. Okay. And if we had distributed generation there, that wouldn't have happened. So um, net metering needs your, to be adjusted. Can you get to your question? Because we do need to wind up in a second. That's exactly where I'm headed. Okay. So, you know, address the fact that net metering lowers your, your transmission and distribution costs. There are benefits there. It takes the peaker power plants offline that help, you know, your, your emissions portfolio and help lower the cost. Well, I know I certainly didn't intend to demonize net metering yeah, in any way. We strongly yeah. support it. Uh, I was simply acknowledging that there are legitimate cost issues that the state needs to discuss more fully. And, and you're absolutely right. When we do that cost analysis and the discussion, we need to value fully all of the significant benefits that distributed generation is providing. And you've hit on a number of them. Um, and again, I, I agree with you that we shouldn't tre treat EVs any differently than we've treated any other load that enters the system in terms of sure. our policies. So. Exactly. No Level field. <laughs> and, uh, okay. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you? Um, take, yeah. I think just to get to the, the kind of combo of the two questions, I mean, it's, um, this isn't related directly to uh, your question, but it's, um, it's relevant uh, around our substations. As a public utility, we do have nine substations that we, uh, we have the responsibility to then maintain and up, upgrade. Um, a related discussion that we just had a couple weeks ago at council was um, what we need to do with our substations as it relates to our wireless infrastructure. I mean, that has some impacts around smart meters um, in the long term, but then ultimately what, what, how we can think about, you know, the substations that have space to allow co-location for um, incumbent providers for wireless uh, technology to then consider uh, use of what's ultimately now public, uh, a public asset. And uh, it's that kind of, it's very, it is detailed. We're bringing on consultants. Um, we want to go through a competitive process to be able to bring on someone that, that has that kind of specialized background. Um, but it's an example of what we do need to think throughout the local level around the use of substations, the maintenance of substations, and then ultimately the future use of our substations. Um, you know, that, that has impacts on, on metering in the long term. Um, I mean, from I'm not an engineer. You'd have to talk with my brother, but you know, I think it, it's a great question. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, well, thank you very much. Please um, help. Please join me in thanking our panelists.
Um,